Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dale. All right, let's warm up. Man, I walked outside this morning, as you all did, unless you teleported to your car or something. I'm like, man, it's cold. And then I looked at my watch, and it told me what the temperature was, and then it, like, felt colder. So I'm just like, ignorance is bliss, I guess. So I don't know what it was at your house, 33 walking out of my door. Woo! As my joke is, I pay too much money to live here for 33. I demand something better and different. We're going to jump into... Um, a series going into 2024, and I think in a lot of ways, what I, these are kind of seem to me to be like the first things, like six essential things for us, for us uh, individually as followers of Jesus, or like at least interested in Jesus, or interested in what the Christianity might be about it for us as a church. Now I know there are many, 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 many things. So I'm like, no way I'm saying these are the only things that are linked. But I think these things, understood, considered, um, curious about, might open some deeper things in our hearts, in our minds. And I think they're really linked together. Things like faith and discipleship of following Jesus, worship, ministry, life in the Spirit, community. Like, I think to understand these things is really super essential. I, um, I call it staring at Scripture. It's kind of what I do. Like, I stare at it, not like in a glaze sort of way, but like, what is jumping out to me? And I would say this past summer when I was on like a study leave, this is what jumped out to me to start our year with. It comes from Hebrews chapter 10, and I try to highlight how these things jump out. Um, the author writes this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Man, we just sang about that a lot. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. So as an outline for us over the next six weeks, that's the verse that jumped out to me as I stared at it. Because what the author is doing here to this letter, he's just explained how what Jesus did was the once and for all final act of sacrifice to bring people back to his Father. And he said, because this is true, this is now the pathway for all of you. Seems to me for us to stare at it for a little bit. But before we go into that, I just want us to pray. I was going to invite you to stand, but I hear we stand up and sit down too much at church. Unlike, I guess, all day long, you just sit. You don't actually move. So I think you actually do stand up and sit down. So if you want to, you can stand with me, but I'm giving you full permission in 2024 not to. I take a posture of receiving. You can read this prayer with me. Father, what we know not, may you teach us. What we have not, may you give us. What we are not, may you make us. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs> Promise I won't make you stand the rest of the way. Even though in some churches, when the pastor's doing well, they stand up and they're like, you go! That's not what we do at all here. Though in six weeks, I'll be in Rwanda, and they do do that, and I'm going to come back and make you do the same. Today we are going to talk about faith, what it is, what it is not. It is a huge topic that I will preach to you in exhaustive form in the next 27 minutes. In many ways, this is an overview, but for some of you, it might be very specific. There's an amazing story about a guy named Horatio Spafford. You may know this name. 
In the 1870s, he was an incredibly successful lawyer, landowner, a lot of businesses in Chicago. Through some different circumstances, he had lost a lot of his fortune. He had lost a lot of his ownership of properties and the great fire and all these different things. He was a devout follower of Jesus, in fact, had committed to going to Europe to help support D.L. Moody's evangelism and outreach and had in so many ways saying, God, I am taking what you have given me and I'm going to worship you and I'm going to serve you. He sent his family on ahead, four daughters and his wife. He was going to meet them a little bit later because he had more work to take care of. And tragically, on the ship ride across the Atlantic, Somehow the ship had shipwrecked, crashed into another ship, I believe. And he received a telegram from his wife that said, all is lost, I'm the only one saved. His four daughters had died in this shipwreck. He made his way across the Atlantic to meet his wife in Europe, and in the very same place where his daughters had died, he wrote these words to the song, It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. When I read amazing words like that of someone who's gone through so much and lost so much, I think two things. One of the things I would say is a very condemning thought. Meaning, this man had amazing faith. No matter what came his way, he could say, it is well with my soul. And the words that the enemy tells me is, your faith will never be like that. Just quit. Those words aren't from God. There's another thought that comes to my head of one of curiosity. And in fact, thoughts and positions and postures of curiosity is exactly where God wants us to be, where I wonder, I wonder what took place in that man's development of his faith, that that's where he got. You see, faith is something that you carry through the ups and downs of your life. It's not just the moment where you might have come to believe something about Jesus or the point of salvation, but it's actually something you bring through the valleys and the peaks of life. Because faith holds you to someone when the lure is to walk away, to what is commonly known now as to deconstruct in order to no longer have it, or slowly fade away into a self-reliant belief system. There's something amazing about faith that we see in Scripture. Jesus, his attention was grabbed by faith. Now, it wasn't faith of people who knew so much or knew all the rules or all the theology. In fact, so many of those people, he's like, man, you don't get it at all. But he made these amazing observations, and some of these are really familiar to you if you know Scripture. If not, I'd encourage you to go back and read these. But he had these encounters with people like when the friends lowered their friend down to be healed by Jesus, Jesus looked up at his friends and saw what? Their faith. He said, your friends have great faith. To the woman that bled for 12 years, and she just reached out to touch him. To her, he said, it is your faith that made you well. To the centurion whose child had died, he says to him, nowhere in Israel have I seen such faith. To the woman who was washing Jesus' feet with her hair and her tears, he says to her, she has done a wonderful thing. It is her faith. Someone who came back to Jesus after deep, deep gratitude of what he has done in his life, to that person, Jesus says, your faith has made you well. In each one of these situations, you can see all throughout Scripture, there is something about a move towards Jesus that Jesus goes, Whew. that is faith. Maybe it was so appealing to him because his faithfulness to us now had a dance partner. It moved in him. 
Now, I want you to hear something because right now, because it happens to me, the enemy says, you don't have this kind of faith. Jesus doesn't notice you. But I want you to hear very clearly, and this is the only thing that you stick in the ground today, not in any of these situations, as Jesus say, because you followed all the rules and all the laws and you know everything, that has earned your right from gain my attention. He never says that. What he says is, you took a step towards me. I'm going all in towards you. There's something there about that. But even when we have moments of this kind of faith, something happens to us, doesn't it? Our initial joy, our, our trust, our belief, it gets worn down. We get a little tired. I mean, this happens so often, even if your New Year's resolution was like, man, I'm going to grow in my faith. You hit January 3rd, and you're like, ah, maybe tomorrow. Whatever it might be. The recipients of this letter to Hebrews, and we're going to read a lot of it today. So if one of your New Year's resolution was, well, I'm going to read more of the Bible, you can check. Hey, I did it today, because Dale read a lot of it. The recipients of this letter started off really, really well. Let me just read this part to you. Hebrews 10, it's, we'll continue on. Remember those early days? And maybe you can even relate to this. Remember those early days after you had received the light? When you endured in great conflict full of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so who were so treated, you suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. It's like this amazing perspective they had of life, of what mattered and what didn't matter because they knew God had something more for them. It's a mountaintop experience. It's a giving your life to Jesus. It's a recommitting of things. It's seeing things for how God sees them. The writer goes on and he, he continues to implore them to connect to that level of faith. So do not throw away your confidence because it will be richly rewarded. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and he will not delay and but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Have you experienced this wearing down? Maybe you've had moments in your life where, man, you served, you helped, you poured out to people, you gave all that you had, and you saw things happening. And it was amazing. But then life gets hard. And sometimes people don't say thank you as often as you think they should. And they don't see the amazing things that you're doing. And so you start to think, man, people just take and take and take. Maybe you poured into relationships. <clears throat> you were cultivating, <clears throat> excuse me, cultivating something and it didn't appear to grow. Or the people didn't cultivate back. When this happens in Christian community, it can even be deeper hurts and deeper loneliness. What I really believe in Hebrews, this letter, is what he's really setting up is this, is that faith has a persevering quality. All right, you ready? You're like, I have no idea what I'm ready for. I'm going to read you a lot, okay? What he is setting up, is that it has a persevering quality. Now, in every single one of my preaching classes that I took 40 years ago, that I don't use any of them anymore, but because I developed my own path, they said, never read this much scripture in one sermon, so I'm going to do it anyways. If you've never stared at Hebrews chapter 11, I want you to stare it with me. And I want you to have it as a heart and mindset of ask yourself, one, what am I hearing? What am I reading? But what is this saying about faith? Like faith. Because if, if faith is the thing that Jesus noticed, we probably should be aware about what it is. It'll be on the screen. I also encourage you to look at your Bibles. 
The author writes this. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that it is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, which is like, like that just, I mean, you're really old if you're as good as dead. Like that's, I'm just, I'm just saying. He was as good as dead. That's just a funny phrase from the Bible. I don't even know where I am now. Came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the countless as the sand of the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Man, if that's something we need to stare at, it's that. Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Then the writer goes on and talks about Isaac, Jacob, Esau, Joseph. Jump down to verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received their dead raised to life again. And jump down to verse 39. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, 
so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And just a little bit in the next chapter. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of this faith. So what do we learn from what we just read, from what we just heard? Few things. Faith is not what you believe. It's who you believe in. Another way of saying it is this. Faith is not a what word. Faith is a who word. Let's zero in on one of these people. His name was Abram at the time. Later, his name became Abraham, which was like a father. But Abram at the time received a vision in Genesis chapter 15. I can't tell you what this vision was like, but it was super specific. And God was telling him certain things, and it was a clear thing. What God told him to do was to move somewhere you don't currently live because I have something for you that you will not go and get on your own. There are times when you're like, God, why are you doing this to me? He's like, because you won't do it yourself. And secondly, he says, though you are old, I will give you children. And they will be like the stars of the sky and the sand of the beach. His response was this in Genesis 15, 6. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Believed. In ancient Hebrew, this word believed is leha amin, or amen. Now, we know amen in our current culture as the guy stopped praying, this is the end. Growing up in my family, we would pray before meals. Amen meant go, because we went and we went after it. For some of you, you may understand that the word amen might also mean so be it, a releasing of things. But really what it means in this context, and I'm going to lean towards simplicity to explain it, the word believed, when, when Abram says, Amen, it is a declaration of trust. Abram's amen to God was not, I believe you're able to do this. It was, I believe you are going to do this because this is something you have promised me. Now, what I have seen in so many people around faith is you are banking all in on things that God never promised. But you yourself have said, well, God should have promised me this, so I'm going all in on this. We create equations in our head. God loves me. God knows that I need this, so therefore God's love for me will give me this. I'm going all in. So be it, or faith, or trust, because it's a who and not a what. It says who is behind this. Faith is a who word. Believing is a who word. Trust is a who word. For a few minutes, I just want to talk about what is faith and what is it not. And once again, huge. And I would say over the next five weeks, hopefully we can connect and impact what this really means. But starting with this is this. Faith is not what you believe. Faith is trust in God. Yes, belief is so important. Like the things of our faith and, and the details and believing in Jesus and believing in one true God. Believing that he is who he says he is, but as James says in chapter 2, verse 19 in his letter, he says this, you believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. He's saying if you're like, man, I have such faith because I believe in Jesus, he's like... So do the demons. Where does that leave you? That is not a word of condemning. It is a word of, that's just the basic things. How are you moving towards him? There's a group of pastors that I do a lot of work with in Rwanda, 
And like I shared, I'm going back in a few weeks to be with them. There's a level of trust and faith that I've seen in these guys, men and women. And it's not because of the things they have. In fact, they have very, very little. little. And it actually is kind of maybe shocking to me in my own way of how little they might even know. But I'll tell you their trust and faith is real because when God moves, they always see it. Even in the smallest, simplest ways, they go, praise be to God. We have created such ways in our life that we don't even need faith to wake up each day because we've already ordained and planned and put into order all of these things. When in fact, these guys who have so little get to see a peace of God that means so much more. What I have found is the fighting to trust when I don't want to has become an amazing, holy endeavor. This reliance on God where I say, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Secondly, when I stare at Hebrews 11, I see this. Faith is not believing in something, but faith is a confident action in response to a living God. There's something each and every person in that chapter of Hebrews 11. By faith, they did this. By faith, they took a step. In every single one of those places that Jesus noticed people's faith, it was a movement they made towards him where their faith became evident. People believe in a lot of things, right? I've served and done ministry in a couple of places where I would say there was an extreme amount of spiritual seekers. One of them was in Maui. It was kind of a center of like all things spiritual. I didn't really meet any atheists there. Everybody believed in something. Another place was actually in San Francisco. When I did ministry there, people, there was like, oh. So they'd come to church, and this happened in Maui and in San Francisco. Like, man, this place has a good vibe to it. This has a good aura. Like, there's a glow around you. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> they were seeking something, and they had their own vision and view, and it was interesting and annoying all at the same time. <laughs> And I would say, even though it's not the same, it, it's still right here, too, in our beautiful little suburb of Campbell, Los Gatos, San Jose. People show their interest in spiritual things by staying engaged with the place as long as they're experiencing something or they're feeling something. How often I've heard someone say, oh, I just wasn't feeling it anymore. That's someone who's seeking spiritual things and not Jesus, per se. This shows up in how people move between faith communities and slip, on, slip out the back door on the way out, or they go into like a privatized, on-demand Netflix with Jesus kind of experience. But what I've seen, my friends, is this kind of faith does not prepare you for the ups and downs of life. This kind of faith doesn't prepare you for the end of life. This kind of faith doesn't prepare you when things don't go the way you think they should go. It doesn't change events, but it absolutely does not prepare you to navigate them. If you look at Hebrews 11, faith is an activity and not a possession. It's a confident action in response to a living God. Look at these simple things. Abel gave an offering. Faith. Noah built a boat. Okay, it was a really big boat, but he built a boat. Noah built. Abraham moved. Faith. Moses, what did he do? He left. Faith. Rahab, what did she do? She welcomed. Faith. The activity of faith shows up in how we interact with the things that we treasure most. Things like money, our kids, our time. How you and we all personally interact with those things that just rip at our heart is the very evidence of whether we're navigating this life with faith or trust with God. 
So what does a life of faith look like? In some ways, it may look like radical generosity over obligated giving. Example, I'm choosing to live off of less so that I can open my heart to more things. It could even be as tangible as the thing I love the most is this money in this world because it gives me security, but I'm going to choose to live off of less to trust God that he's going to come through by letting go. My friends, any action of faith has a sense of human risk to it because whenever you narrow your options and say, this is the path I'm going to take of faith, of like trust that God has asked me to do this, it feels risky because we always want a way out. We always want, what are my options? We always want, like, if this doesn't work, I want A, B, C, and D, all the things lined up. That seems like the human reasonable thing to do. And it feels risky. So I wonder today, my friends, what decision do you need to make today that will require you to trust God. My guess, he's been knocking on some of your doors for a long time to trust him that he has your back, to trust you, him that he has everything you actually need. Here's something I want you to see if we can zero in here. Faith and trust are not just amazing actions by these amazing pillars of faith. Faith involves ordinary people, ordinary life, trusting God with the outcome. Let me show you some ordinary sinful people. If you look at Hebrews 11 again, Abraham, you're like, oh, pillar of faith. He lied about his wife to get out of a situation. Sarah, when told she was going to have a kid, even though she was as good as dead, laughed at God. Rahab made her living as a prostitute. David committed adultery and had an innocent man killed. These are ordinary, dead-in-their-sins people who are commended for their faith. People of faith do ordinary actions, my friends. Abel gave an offering. Abraham moved. Moses was hid in a basket Rahab was hospitable. So often we are all looking for our big moment, right? I want my moment. I want that thing that I know that I'm making a difference in my life and it matters and I want to be, it's like our 15 minutes of fame. Like, God, I'm giving you everything. I just want this moment because we've all created in our head what that moment would look like. But lo most likely your moment, my friends, is in the simple faithfulness. It's being faithful to God's direction by being faithful in your friendships, by being faithful in your marriage, by being faithful in your generosity, by being faithful in your serving of other people. Because faith says, even though I can't control the outcome, I trust you. The enemy says, you deserve your moment. And God says, I have moments for you, but they are stacked up on top of each other. My friends, I can't tell you how many times I've sat across the table from somebody saying, this happened 20 years ago in my life, and it changed this thing forever, and I don't even remember. And I'm like, are you sure I said that to you? Like, I randomly said something helpful, which I'm sure I just stole from somebody else. But they credit it with me, and I'm like, praise be to God. So many moments I have cried out to God and said, where about me? And God's like, you just be faithful. My friends, the enemy wants you to believe that there's just a moment and God's like, I've got so many moments for you. Be faithful. Many of us are really familiar with what's known as the serenity prayer. It's a prayer that has become really popular and used often at the end of um, AA meetings or support groups. It goes like this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. This prayer is so helpful. But this is just the beginning of what this prayer actually was written to be. 
I think if we understand the whole prayer written by R Reinald Niebuhr in 1926, we might start to understand how it is we grow in the simple things and our faith comes with it. He writes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen, so be it. Let's sit before God for a few moments.